Old shotguns sometimes need a little TLC to get them in tip-top shape. Let's take a look at this old Remington. It's a Model 11 semi-automatic shotgun made in Ilion, New York. There are no serial number records for early Remingtons, but the markings on this gun date it to about 1911. There were more than 850,000 of these guns produced before it was discontinued in 1947. This gun has a few problems that are easily repaired with a little time and patience. The first thing I noticed during initial inspection was the oil-soaked stocks. This is a result of over-oiling through the years. The butt plate is also chipped, but luckily not cracked. Finally, the butt stock and forend have several cracks. The cracked forend is common on Model 11s due to the very thin wood around the magazine tube. I begin by taking off the forend. It's removed by holding the barrel back slightly and unscrewing the magazine cap. Now the barrel, friction ring, and recoil spring can be slid off the magazine tube. The buttstock is next. I remove the locking screw, then the tang screw, and slide the stock off the receiver. It's easy to see just how much oil has soaked into the wood. Even though Remington put a reinforcement piece in the forend, time dried out the glue and the forend cracked at the thinnest part. Also, one of the locating pins for the forend has been lost. Now I can strip off the old finish. It's a varnish type coating and it's easily removed with Miles Gilbert stock finish remover. Several layers of newspaper protect the bench and a pair of gloves protect my hands. It's important that the butt plate is removed when stripping the finish, but I'll put it back on when sanding the stock. Finish remover is generously applied to the stock and forend and allowed to work for about 10 minutes or until the old finish starts to soften. Then I scrape off the finish with a plastic scraper, such as an old key card. The checkering is cleaned out with a small nylon brush, following the lines first in one direction, then the other. Once all the old finish is scraped off, a piece of burlap will remove the last of the residue. With the finish stripped, I can begin removing the oil from the wood. A volatile solvent such as acetone will penetrate deep into the wood and lift out the oil. First, I scrub the wood with a soaked cloth. As the oil seems to go all the way through the stock, submerging it is necessary. After an hour, a noticeable amount of oil has been removed. I cover it back up and soak some more. Drying the stock under a heat lamp also helps draw out the oil. Finally, the wood is allowed to dry for a few days, evaporating the solvent. Now, I can see all the cracks that need to be repaired. The dents from years of use will need to be steamed out as well. Now, I can begin fixing the butt plate. There are a couple of chips missing, but there aren't any cracks. And overall, it's in pretty good shape for being over 100 years old. The butt plate is easily repaired with the epoxy from the Miles Gilbert Bedrock glass bedding kit. This is a little like filling a tooth. A small hole for a wood pin will provide additional support. Before applying the epoxy, I rough up the surface with a file. Then undercut the chips with a Dremel tool 
to provide a mechanical lock. A little black dye is mixed with equal parts of resin and hardener. The wood pin is glued in the hole. Masking tape along the edge of the butt plate will provide a dam to keep the epoxy in place until it cures. The chips are carefully filled in. I let it cure overnight, then remove the tape. A needle file is used to remove the excess epoxy. It doesn't have to be perfect at this point, as I will reinstall the butt plate when I sand the stock. Now I can work down the excess on the surface, again being very careful not to file into the original material. I use a single line checkering cutter to closely match the original molded in checkering. A vayner works perfectly for the really tight curve at the bottom. 600 grit abrasive paper is used to remove the file marks and blend in the repair. Wow, the repair is hardly noticeable. With the butt plate repaired, I begin fixing the cracks. Soaking out the oil with acetone loosened the wood reinforcement ring in the forend, so I've removed it for now. The first crack I'm going to repair is the one through the locating pin hole. Since the crack goes farther back into the forend than the hole, I begin by drilling the hole deeper, being careful not to go through the side of the forend. I'm using a polyurethane glue. It's waterproof, and because the glue expands slightly as it cures, it fills the cracks really well. Once I've got glue down in the hole, a dowel rod will force it out through the crack. I'll leave the dial in for support and drill it out later. These cracks are a little more difficult. I apply glue to the surface, then very gently spread the crack apart several times, wicking the glue down into the crack. This one, in the head of the stock, is a bit easier. I drill it out as deep as possible. Again, the hole is filled with glue and I use the dowel to force the glue into the crack. Often cracks are deeper than you think. You can see how far down this crack goes. Again, the dowel is left in for support. Now that the glue has cured in the first crack, I move to the others. I put glue on the outside surface and work it down into the cracks. The last step is to glue in the reinforcement ring. Surgical tubing will keep everything tight until the glue cures. With the stock repaired, you can see there are lots of dents and dings from the years of use, as well as dried glue. The next step is to take out the dents. Steaming a dent will raise it nearly even with the surrounding wood 
and reduce the amount of sanding required. This technique only works when the wood fibers are crushed and not broken. It won't work with scratches as a scratch cuts and removes wood fibers. My preferred technique of removing dents is to use a household iron and a clean wet cloth. With the wet cloth over the dent, I simply place the corner of the hot iron against the cloth. The steam penetrates the wood, expands the fibers, and raises the dent. It's important not to leave the iron in place too long, as it's possible to scorch the wood. The iron will dry out the wet cloth fairly quickly, so a fresh part of the cloth will push the maximum amount of steam into the wood. It may take several cycles of steaming to fully raise a dent. Some dents can be raised completely, while others only partially. Once the dents have been raised, I'm ready to begin sanding. Even after steaming, there are several dents and dings that have to be sanded out. To remove them, I'm using the Miles Gilbert Stock Refinishing Kit. It contains everything necessary to refinish a gun stock. One of the most important components is a selection of high quality sandpaper ranging from 100 to 220 grit. I start by wrapping the 100 grit paper around the sanding block and secure it with masking tape. A firm backer will ensure level sanding and prevent waves in the wood that will show up in the finish. Following the sanding chart included in the kit will prevent missing any areas of the stock. I start by sanding the comb using long, smooth strokes. Sanding with the butt plate attached prevents rounding over the edges. I sand only the minimum amount necessary as I don't want to change the dimensions of the stock. All I need to do with the 100 grit is to remove any remaining imperfections, but no more. It's crucial to examine each area before moving on. The tow line is next. I'm careful not to sand too much of the checkering or too close to the inletting with the 100 grit paper. Now I can move on to the sides of the buttstock, always being sure to sand with the grain, never across it. When the sandpaper wears down, I simply tear off the old portion and retape. Imperfections such as this one will have to be filled, as sanding it out would require removing too much wood. After sanding the entire buttstock with 100 grit, it's time to raise the grain. Using a damp paper towel, I wet the stocks and dry them with a heat gun. The water causes the wood fibers to stand up and they can be removed with the next sanding. After each sanding, I like to take the stock outside and examine it closely in natural sunlight. Any defects or missed areas are easy to spot. Some defects can be removed with additional sanding. Some will need to be filled. And some, you just have to live with. I sand out the ones I can with 100 grit paper. Again, I raise the grain and go to the next grid of abrasive paper, in this case, 150. Once the sanding with 150 is done, I'm ready to fill the areas that can't be sanded out. There are several. 
one next to the check ring, one along the top tang, and two along the bottom tang. The first step is to lightly scrape the surface, which will remove any remaining finish. Since I'm using epoxy to fix the area next to the tang, release agent will prevent it from sticking to the metal. Five minute epoxy mixed with sanding dust makes perfect stock filler and masking tape keeps the epoxy out of the checkering. Notice that the wood has shrunk slightly away from the receiver. This area is the recoil shoulder, which absorbs the shock from firing the gun, and if left unrepaired, will likely cause the stock to split. I'm going to bed this area using the Miles Gilbert Bedrock Glass Bedding Kit. Relief areas cut into the head of the stock will provide additional support for the glass bedding. Again, release agent will prevent the bedrock from sticking to the receiver. I use equal parts of resin and hardener along with brown dye. Micro balloons thicken the mixture and help prevent runs. I let the bedrock cure overnight, then remove the stock from the action. The stock is reinstalled before I cut away the excess bedding compound. Tape along the receiver will prevent scratches. With the bedding compound trimmed away, I begin sanding with 220 grit abrasive paper. I use the rounded edge of the backer to sand the flutes. The point of the comb has a nice, crisp line, which I'm being careful to preserve. 220 grit doesn't remove much wood, but I'm still careful around the tangs and against the receiver, as I don't want the wood below the surface of the metal. The forend is done exactly the same way. Again, tape will serve as a reminder to stay away from the area next to the receiver and magazine cap. I begin with the top rails, again using long strokes to keep the rails even. As the fore end is in pretty good shape, I'm skipping the 100 grit and starting with 150. The finger grooves can be easily sanded with the rounded edge of the backer. Notice the craft sticks that I'm using to keep from crushing the forend. I'll stay away from the checkering and both ends until the final sanding with 220 grit. Again, I'm careful as I don't want to remove too much wood. The last step is a final raising of the grain. Now, I'm ready to apply sealer. Sealing helps prevent moisture from entering the wood. I'm using Laurel Mountain Forge stock sealer mixed with stain to give the wood a darker color. I apply it generously to the stock, completely coating all surfaces. At this point, you can really begin to see the beauty of the wood. Some areas need additional sealer as it soaks in. I keep the surface wet for about 20 minutes, then wipe off the excess and allow the stocks to dry overnight.
For the finishing process, I'll need just a few basic items. I begin by mixing finish with mineral spirits. This thins the finish and makes it easier to work with. I'm also adding stain to the mix as sanding the stock will tend to lighten the color. The butt plate is reinstalled to keep from rounding over the edge of the stock. I squirt on a generous amount of finish and sand it in. Giving this finishing process its name of a sanded in finish. Sanding creates a fine slurry of finish and wood dust which fills the grain of the wood. Each area is sanded carefully. I work my way around the stock using the sanding diagram. The excess finish is wiped off before it hardens, making sure to go across the grain to keep from pulling out the slurry. This is an edge saver. It's a shop made tool that lets me sand to the edge without rounding it over. I like to put one coat of finish on in the morning and one in the evening. After the second coat, the grain is beginning to fill. I'll continue to sand in coats using progressively finer grits of sandpaper. The last sanding is with 1000 grit, and now the stocks have a nice satin finish with the grain completely filled. Years of use has flattened the tops of the diamonds in the checkering, so it needs to be touched up. It's not difficult to recut, and I'll only need a few tools, some magnification, a checkering cradle, and good light. The action is reinstalled on the stock to make holding it easier and allow access to the checkering on the wrist. The checkering cradle holds the stock securely while allowing it to be rotated. Now before beginning the actual process of checkering, the finish should be completely cured. I like to wait a couple of weeks to let the finish harden up. The first step is deepening the border lines with a 60 degree single line cutter. The steep angle of the cutter follows the existing lines as I deepen each one slightly. At this point, I'm mostly concerned with cleaning the finish out of each line. Very light pressure and short back and forth strokes are all that's required. After making one pass, I'll chase out the line again, deepening it slightly. This cutter cuts only on the push stroke. Now, I recut each line inside the pattern. I begin with what were the master lines. The stock has been swapped end for end to extend the lines to the border. Since I've cut the border deeper, I can run the cutter right up to the edge without running over. Another method when reaching the border is to reverse a cutter in the handle so it cuts on the pull stroke. Then a technique called hook and pull is used. The tool is placed against the border and pulled back, which prevents cutting past the line. Extra care must be taken in the corners as the lines are short. They can be deepened with a veiner. It's a small V-shaped chisel 
that's perfect for the job. A good light source is needed to see your work. It should be kept at an angle to make the lines easier to see and follow. Once all the lines are cut in one direction, I begin cutting the crossing lines. After one pass, the diamonds are all redefined, but the tops are still flat. Now I'm ready to use the 90 degree cutter. This cutter will give the diamonds their final shape and point them up. Next, I deepen the crossing lines. A final light pass in the opposite direction of the last lines cut will make it hard to tell in which direction the last pass was made and make the diamonds really pop. Once all the lines have been recut, the outside border lines are cleaned out with the 60 degree cutter. A border tool cuts a rounded edge along the outside of the pattern. The border is cut to the correct depth when all the finish has been removed. The corners are deepened with a short 90 degree cutter and a small pocket knife works perfectly for the areas I can't reach with the cutter. A final brushing removes all the sawdust. Once all the checkering has been recut, I apply the same finish that was used on the stock. Then. I reassemble the gun and it's ready to go to the range.